Hello everyone, my name is Claudius Kazan. In this video we take a look at dynamics in music, things that change like tempo and loudness. We also take a look at uh, repeats and repeat signs, how we repeat certain sections without having to rewrite them. We're going to continue with the Robert Starr exercises. I will perform a uh, section from the number nine that was in your homework and the solfege number two that I also uh, assigned you last time. So please stay tuned. Welcome back. Let's talk a little bit about tempo in music. What does tempo mean? Tempo is the speed at which the, uh, the beat or the, uh, the pulse in music progresses. Okay? And uh, composers have made an effort from the very, very beginning, you know, from the Renaissance period, to actually indicate how tempo you know, should be uh, used in music. Uh, nothing, again, was standardized. Um, the metronome was not invented until the 1800s, 1816, to be uh, uh, very precise. And um, even the classical composers bef before did not have a, an exact concept of, of tempo. Uh, instead, they were using terms that they've devised very, very early. Uh, the, the Italians have actually done this. They've came up with the idea of of uh, standardizing certain uh, elements so they can put them in the beginning of the music to signify, you know, how, how fast should the music go. Now, sometimes they would forget to put it in there. Um, Bach does it a few times that he uh, either forgets or he, you know, conveniently forgets how to, uh, how to notate certain uh, tempos, but it's very easy to kind of figure out, even if the tempo indication is missing, because you're looking at the page and you see a lot of 16th notes and something like that, and, uh, you know, repeated 16th notes and so you'll say, okay, well, this one looks like a fast movement. It's to be performed in a certain way, okay? So, uh, um, you know, you also look at the uh, form. Uh, what kind of forms did they use? Uh, for example, sonata form um, in the Baroque period followed a pretty standard way of slow, fast, slow, fast. Uh, and in the classical period, changed a little bit. You know, they dropped the, the slow movement in the, in the beginning, and they started with a fast movement and then went to a slow one and then to a fast one again. Okay? But again, Different composers did it, did it differently. Uh, in the Romantic period, uh, it was, you know, a free-for-all, basically. Um, nobody was tied into the, the early forms of the Baroque and Classical. So composers were a lot freer now to start the music in any way they wanted, either with a slow movement or a fast, um, depending on how they felt and how they envisioned the piece uh, to go, okay? Um, I have some examples for you guys in here of how composers have used tempo indications uh, from the beginning. And uh, let's look at uh, Mozart, uh, sonata number, um, actually not, you know, it has a K in here. K is, uh, stands for Köhel Versailles, which means uh, Köhel's catalog. Uh, this guy, Köhel, Ludwig, Ludwig von Köhel, um, cataloged Mozart work, Mozart's works, uh, you know, years and years after uh, Mozart was dead, um, and um, he uh, assigned K numbers, which comes from his own name, uh, to all his works. This one comes from K331, okay? 331 comes pretty much, you know, this is a late work already of Mozart, okay? And uh, if you look at the, uh, at the um, tempo indication here, uh, it says Allegretto. Okay, now what does that allegretto mean? Let's go back to this chart for a little bit. Uh, I put together a chart for you guys that uh, lists all the, uh, you know, tempo indications here in alphabetical order on the left. And um, in the middle is the description, you know, approximately what they mean, and then recommended beats per minute. These are just recommended beats per minute, okay? It doesn't mean that you have to do it this fast or this slow. It's just rec recommended in there. And uh, we're going to take a look at some uh, pieces uh, to compare tempos uh, next, uh, to see how, uh, you know, even world-class performers today uh, are choosing tempos very differently. Uh, but they stay within certain 
guidelines. Okay? Let's take, for example, adagio. Okay? Here's the second term on the page there. At ease or slowly, that's what it means. And the tempo indication, anywhere between 66 and 76. Okay? Uh, or allegro, lively and fast, meaning anywhere between 120 and 140. Now, from my experience, 120 is quite fast. You know, if you can play Allegro at 120, that means you're pretty good. <laughs> you're pretty good technically to do something like this. But you can go even faster than that. You can go 140, okay? Andante, for example, means at an easy walking pace, okay? And, uh, you know, again, you know, you can, you can think about a, a pace that uh, signifies walking at a, at a nice leisurely pace. Uh, largo, for example, means broadly or slowly, anywhere between 40 and 60. Um, but then we have the terms that signify changes, dynamic changes in music, okay? So what I just showed you right now, like adagio, allegretto, allegro, andante, these are terms that we put in the beginning of the piece that signify how fast we should, we should perform this piece. But then we have terms like accelerando, or allargando, or ritartando, or stringendo. These are all Italian uh, terms that mean that you should do something with the tempo, okay? It's a dynamic change in the tempo. For example, the accelerando, meaning gradually getting faster. Now, how much faster are you going to get? We're not going to get too fast. You're going to stay within the guidelines of the piece, okay? So if the piece progresses in an allegro uh, pace, yeah, you're going to get faster, but not too much faster, okay? So stay within the guidelines. Same thing if you're performing a slow piece, an allegro, a, a largo, for example, okay? And you see an accelerando in there. You're not going to go crazy going up to all the way to allegro. You're going to stay within the guidelines of largo, okay? Uh, and things like that. Um, you also have a term like a tempo, which meaning, okay, that doesn't mean, you know, a tempo meaning a, a certain speed. That means they're going back to the original speed. So, for example, you have an allegro, okay, and uh, the composer puts an accelerando somewhere in there, and you're supposed to accelerate the music. But then he puts a tempo. That means go back to the tempo. So stop accelerating anymore. <laughs> go back to the original tempo. Okay? So you have to also know what the original tempo is. Okay? So you look and see, how did I perform Allegro in the beginning of the piece? And that's how you all of a sudden are supposed to go. So a tempo means back to the original tempo. Okay? Or a, a term like mosso. Mosso in Italian means movement. Okay? Uh, that's usually associated with other, other terms like meno, mosso, meaning less motion. Okay? So you have to learn a little bit of uh, Italian there. Meno mosso means a little less motion, or, or più mosso. Più mosso means more motion, so add a little more motion, a little more lively than before. And then re remember, you know, uh, things like uh, vivace, very, very fast, okay? Uh, or, or vivo, lively, and so on. Now, you'll see a lot more terms than these. These are just the most common ones. Um, so. You know, if you guys want to memorize them, it's fine. If not, you can always come back to the chart and see exactly what they mean. But I'm sure you already know quite a few of these, you know, especially the Allegro, the Andante, the Andantino, the uh, Adagio. These are, you know, used all over the place. Again, back to the Allegretto uh, from uh, Mozart uh, K331. Okay. I've uh, heard performers uh, play this quite fast, um, you know, because they want to show off. Uh, how fast they can play the uh, Alla Turca. It's a, it's a really nice, lively piece, but, you know, remember Mozart has put here Allegretto, meaning not too fast, not, not as fast an, as an Allegro. So make, uh, you know, make sure that when you, if you ever have to perform that, you look very carefully at the um, uh, tempo indication by Mozart himself there. Okay, and then I want to show you this um, piece by uh, Modest Mussorgsky. Russian composer, uh, a uh, composer from the uh, um, Romantic period this time. And uh, he adds another word here to the word allegro. He says giusto, meaning strict. So you are to perform this in a strict allegro. Okay? In other words, don't slow down, don't accelerate, don't do anything. Stay very steady with your tempo. So pick a, an allegro tempo and keep it there. Uh, also, what's easy, uh, uh, what's interesting in here, look at the uh, time signatures in there, the meter. 
He starts with a 5-4. Remember that complex meter 5-4? We talked about it two videos ago. Okay? And then he switches to a 6-4, and then back to a 5-4, and then back to a 6-4, and so on. So he goes back and forth between th these two, uh, two meters in here. However, th those quarter notes there all have to be performed very strictly. Dum, bum, 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 bum. Okay? So uh, this is how Mr. Mussorgsky is using the uh, Allegro here. Okay, let's take a look at, uh, this is from Debussy's Ballade for piano. You can see he's using Andantino con Moto. Andantino means, uh, you know, a small Andante, maybe a little bit uh, faster than Andante, not quite Andante, but con Moto means with motion. So in other words, yeah, move it along. Forget about Andantino, you know, really move it along in here, okay? And tempo rubato means tempo with freedom, okay? In other words, don't stay too, uh, too strict. It's not tempo giusto like Matas Mussorgsky was using. This is exactly the opposite. This is tempo rubato, meaning take liberties in here. You know, it's okay to go a little faster. It's okay if you slow down a little bit. You don't have to stay in a very, very strict. Follow the music and follow, uh, you know, what you feel about uh, this. Of course, this is a ballad, so, you know, it has a lot more freedom in there. Uh, this is from Beethoven, one of uh, Beethoven Echo says this, the one in E flat major, and uh, it says here, leggero et animato, you know, leisurely but with animation, okay? So you were to perform that. This is usually performed quite fast. It's written in 2-4, so normally you go 1-2-1-2. One, two, one, two. Da da dum da da dum da da dum But performers go really quickly on this, like... Da da dum, 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 da da. Almost like the beat is is uh, assigned to the to the measure now, not the actual beats that consist the measure, but the beginning of each measure. Okay, da da dum, da da dum, da da dum, da da dum. Okay, so you can see how composers uh, use these terms. All right, this is uh, from a modern composition. Everybody probably knows this one. This is from the Entertainment by Scott Joplin. And uh, Joplin is not using any Italian terms. He says, forget about those. I'm going to use my own. Not fast, okay? Plain and simple, in English, not fast. Now, I know a lot of performers like to play this very fast because, again, it's, uh, it shows what they can do technically. But, you know, Joplin says, don't play it too fast. Okay? So nice and... Uh, you know, at a walking space, maybe a little faster, and so on. Okay, great. So you can see from all these that uh, these tempo indications are not strict, okay? They're just guidelines uh, for you guys to, uh, to pick your own tempo, and when you pick your own tempo, you have to think about a few things. Number one, time period and what form you're performing. Is it a concerto? Is it a sonata? Is it a slow movement? Is it a fast movement? Okay. Think about what you can play. You know, don't play too fast. If you can afford to play fast, don't play fast. Um, but again, don't play too slow because uh, then people will see right through you that you're, you're trying to do something here to mask certain uh, technical deficiencies in there. So uh, choose your tempos uh, wisely. Okay? You don't have to do it fast, but don't stay slow if you, if you have to perform at a, at a nice uh, uh, speed. And uh, I'm going to show you a couple of examples from here. Um, number one, I chose the Bach Double Concerto for two violins, performed in three different ways uh, by three world-class uh, performers uh, now. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to play the music for you, and I'm going to tap on the metronome um, as they play just to show how uh, different their performers, uh, performances are in terms of tempo. Okay, and uh, I'm going to go to Rachel first, the Rachel Podger, um, and uh, let's, li let's listen to what she does. Um, by the way, she performs on a uh, Baroque violin here with a Baroque orchestra, okay, and uh, this is the first movement again from the Bach double concerto for two violins and orchestra.
Okay, my metronome says here 93, but I saw it going up to 100 and something, so let's average that to about 96, okay? So she's performing an allegro, because this is what, uh, what uh, Bach has put in here, at 93. Okay, remember allegro should have been between 120 and uh, 140. Wow, she's playing it slow, 93. Okay, let's look at the uh, next performer in here. And uh, that is, uh, let's do uh, Gidon Kramer this time. Let's see how Gidon Kramer performs this. <laughs> Okay, my metronome says 110. Okay, so that's closer to 120, what Allegro should be. Okay, when I first heard this performance, I thought it was so fast. I never played it myself so fast, but this was like many, many, many years ago. Uh, this, was a re this is a recording from 1982, so um, that's uh, when I was uh, much younger. <laughs> okay, but I thought he played it so fast. Okay, now let's look at uh, what Hillary does, Hillary Hahn. Okay, my metronome says uh, somewhere about 117, okay? I know they probably meant 120 to go exactly uh, with the uh, metronome at 120 as is the uh, suggested uh, speed for Allegro, uh, but it looks like they slowed it down just a little bit. Anyway, it's there. It's up in it where it should be in the... Uh, I think of the uh, three of them, Hillary's the fastest, okay? And then Gidon and finally uh, Rachel coming in third with... Uh, <laughs> performance of 96, remember, that's quite slow. Now, you have to remember something in here. I think it's the temperament of the uh, uh, performer, too, that dictates, in most of the cases, how fast you want to play, you know. Um, if you play on modern instruments, especially, you know, these young people today, we like to go fast, we like to travel fast, we like to do things quickly, we like to multitask and so on. Uh, it's probably natural that they would choose a faster tempo than, uh, you know, people uh, playing on, uh, on Baroque instruments. Uh, and it's true that uh, the tempo has probably come up through the ages too, just like the pitch. Uh, maybe back in the Baroque, they put an allegro in there, they didn't really mean 120. They probably meant, you know, 90 or something like that, quite, uh, quite a bit slower. They had all the time in the world, uh, you know, they didn't have the internet and the uh, devices that we have today to keep us all informed and, and, and you know, involved and so on. Uh, I think Rachel did a, a great uh, job to uh, research uh, historic performances and so on, and she chose a, a slower tempo for her rendition of the Bach double, which is great. I, I enjoy them all, and I think they're all great, uh, great performances. Let's go on and take a look at um, uh, another, um, another piece uh, that I want you to uh, compare right now. It's from Beethoven's uh, third movement from his second symphony, okay? You'll see again here two performances that are quite, quite different in terms of uh, tempo. Um, the first one is with uh, Christopher Hogwood and the uh, Academy of Ancient Music. Again, they perform on uh, period instruments, and um, this is different. This is a fast performance, I think, uh, for for somebody playing on uh, period instruments. But I think the uh, Beethoven Second Symphony Scherzo, uh, it's such a lively piece and so on. It, it's great if you play, it can play it uh, fast. Okay, my uh, metronome says exactly 100. Remember, this uh, symphony was written back in, uh, I believe, 1802, okay? Yes, it was written in 1802, so metronome was not invented yet, okay? Metronome was invented in 1816, 
Okay, so Beethoven probably just put in there Scherzo Allegro. Okay, now editors later, people who edited music, he you know published his music, uh, went back and said, okay, you know, let's put a metronome uh, 100 in here. Uh, that's probably what uh, Beethoven really meant. Okay, so uh, that was the now. Listen to this performer. Uh, this is Sergio Celibidake with the uh, Munich Philharmonic. This is an older performance, but let's see how fast he performs this. Wow, this is slow. This is at, my metronome says 75, but uh, I saw it go to 74, 73, but 75, it's quite a bit slower than 100, okay? You can see now how these metronome markings in here and tempo markings are really not to be taken very, very strictly, okay? You can have uh, credible performances even if you're a little bit slower or if you're much faster and so on. What really matters in here is the character of the piece. Are you bringing out the character of the piece, okay? Even if your tempo varies a little bit from, from one performer to the other. Now, uh, mind you, this guy, Sergio Celibidake, was known to uh, perform things quite a bit slower. Okay? He believed that if he slows down the music, the, the listener has a chance to uh, pick up a lot more details uh, in the music than uh, if you let the music go at its speed. Now, that kind of goes contrary of, in, in what Beethoven would have liked to hear in his, in his pieces, but again, Beethoven's not around anymore, so we can take some uh, liberties in there. To tell you the truth, I kind of like his performances slow, because again, I could hear certain details that I always miss when I listen to performances that go by quite a little quicker. Okay, so I I really do enjoy his uh, performances, much slower. Uh, I wonder how the musicians felt when he uh, stood in front of the orchestra to suggest these tempos. <laughs> You know, very, uh, very interesting to have been there and uh, maybe at one of the re rehearsals and see uh, how the uh, musicians re reacted when he says, okay, we're going to do the scherzo from uh, uh, Beethoven Symphony Number no. 2 at 76 instead of, instead of the normal 100 that other people do it at. Well, very interesting. Let's talk a little bit about loudness in music this time. You know, so we took a little bit about tempo, about dynamic changes in tempo. Let's talk about loudness in music. Um, again, that could be di dictated by the, the form itself, the music itself that you have to uh, perform. Um, you know, you probably wouldn't perform a slow movement or so in, in, in triple forte or something. You know, with forte meaning loud and so. So you have to be mindful of the mood of the piece, what the composer really wants to bring through with, with that movement that you pick the, uh, the right dynamic in there. Again, people have different temperaments. They, uh, they like to perform music more quietly or some people are more lively and so on. But again, there are certain uh, guidelines that uh, we usually follow when we do this. Here's a chart of, um, of a few um, very commonly known um, loudness markings. And I'm starting with a pianissimo in here, the double P, which means very, very soft. And, uh, you know, you move to the, all the way through uh, to the double F, which means fortissimo, very loud. That doesn't mean that these are the only ones, okay? I've seen scores where they have four Ps, four, you know, piani sissi sissimo, whatever, you know, piano pianissimo or something like that, uh, with four Ps or four Fs, you know, triple or quadruple forte in there, we, we call it in English, which means ridiculously loud. Okay? And there are some pieces out there, especially by modern composers, that you know, really can, can you know, be set to, uh, to quadruple forte in there because you know, maybe there's a beat in there or something that's supposed to be played really loud to signify something. You know, the composer, composer would actually use some of these um, terms in there. Now, there's other ones like F and P, like forte piano, what does that mean? That means play forte, meaning loud, but then immediately go down to piano, okay? 
uh, or terms like SFZ, meaning sforzando. Okay, that's a short a shorthand for sforzando, meaning with a sudden action. Uh, we're going to take a look at a piece of music later coming up um, from um, Beethoven's String Quartet uh, number four, uh, Opus 18. And uh, we'll listen how, you know, the performers in here, the Tokyo String Quartet, uh, performs those sforzandos. Very nice. And then you have the hairpins. Look at those little things in there. Hairpins are like, uh, you know, little lines uh, that either go up or down that signify, you know, if you were to make a crescendo or decrescendo uh, in the music. Now, hairpins you use um, in short passages. You know, you're not going to use a hairpin uh, over an entire line of music. Um, you know, if you need to do something like that, um, it's probably more efficient to just write crescendo in the beginning and let the performance know that, okay, from now on until I state otherwise, I want you guys to crescendo, getting louder. But hairpins you use in small uh, passages and so, uh, especially if you have to use quite a few, one after the other, meaning that the music should get louder and then softer, or softer and louder and so on. You can use the hairpins. Um, we'll take a look at that and see how the hairpins uh, uh, work uh, as well. Okay, let's take a listen to this uh, quartet number four, um, Opus 18 by Beethoven, and see how the performers um, interpret uh, loudness markings in here. Notice that the, the piece starts piano, meaning uh, soft, but then it has a sudden sforzando in the second measure. Uh, and after that, it reverts back to piano, because that's the dynamic at that point, okay? As forzando is just a, a sudden uh, accent that you have to put in there, uh, and then you have to revert back to the underlying uh, dynamic there, which is uh, piano, all right? And um, towards the end, um, they have a crescendo, towards the end of the, you know, the, the example I'm giving here, not the uh, end of the, uh, you know, movement, which is much longer. But in here, you'll see that, um, you know, four bars from the end when I'm ending here, they have a crescendo. It's actually written in, cresc, as an abbreviation. Crescendo, meaning, okay, start crescendoing until I tell you to either, you know, you, until you've reached a certain dynamic, or I'm, I'm going to tell you what the dynamic is going to be. So in this case, you are to crescendo until you hit the fortissimo mark, three bars uh, from the uh, end of the example in here. Okay, So you crescendo basically for two bars until you hit a big, nice uh, fortissimo here. And you'll know that you know, these uh, chords that come up in there, the last three bars, are to be performed in fortissimo, really loud. Okay, let's see how that sounds when they actually perform this piece of music. Very interesting, right? And uh, that's exactly how I like to hear the music. Very dynamic, very nice. Uh, they really take care of all the details in the music. Um, Beethoven is a master of, of dynamics. That's why his music is so much loved and appreciated because of its dynamic, uh, dynamic character and so on. All right, let's uh, look at another topic now, which is repeats. Um, Repeats in music. We use repeats basically to uh, make our lives a little easier and we don't have to notate music that we have already notated down. Um, if, the, if we were to repeat the same content uh, in, a, in a piece of music, it's probably best to use repeats rather than writing the music again, especially if music doesn't change and so it makes absolutely no sense to write it again. Instead, use repeats. It makes you know, the life of the performers easier because they don't have to flip pages and so on. They can stay on the same page. Just go back to a certain section and repeat it and so on. Now, why do composers repeat music? You know, because, you know, first of all, they might like to restate the same beautiful melodies that they've created and so on. You, you need to, you know. And also to make the music a little longer, okay? Uh, instead of uh, creating new material all the time. It's also a way to unify pieces, a way to uh, wrap everything into, uh, into sections and so on that uh, you know, repeat again. 
Uh, we're talking about uh, you know repeating certain material that's important in the music. Um, you want the listeners to identify the piece of music by certain melodies or certain motives and so on. So they repeat that again. You know, they, they usually repeat it in sections and so on. So you always, the, f the simplest way to repeat in here is to use the uh, repeat signs. The uh, repeat signs are, are the repeat bar lines. They uh, look like that with two doubles, two double uh, bars and, and two dots. And notice this one in this example, the two bar lines face each other. One has the, uh, the dots facing forward and the other one later on the piece has the dots facing backwards. That means that the section in between these two repeat signs are to, is to be performed again. Okay, so you repeat it only once and you go on. So basically in here, look at the, uh, the red uh, arrow. It means that you, know, you start the beginning of the piece, and by the way, that first measure uh, can be extended to any number of measures. It's just there you know, to show you how the logistics really works. So you place it from the beginning of the piece. Uh, you go through that first sign, okay, uh, all the way until you get to the second one. And once you hit that second repeat sign, it says, okay, go back to the first one and repeat this section between the repeat signs again, okay? After you've done repeating it, you continue with the piece as if nothing happened, okay? So this is the simplest way to repeat in music is to use repeat signs and you put the music that you want to repeat between these two signs. So the performance know or the performers know, okay, repeat anything that's between these two repeat signs again. Uh, another way of doing things is to write first and second endings. Uh, let's follow the red line right now. Music, let's say, starts in the beginning, okay, and again, any number of measures and so on. And you're gonna hit the uh, uh, an area where you see a bracket there with a the number one and the re uh, repeat sign. That means that the first time around, when you go through the piece, you go through the first ending, the first, uh, anything that's under the first bracket there, and you stop at the uh, repeat sign and you go back to either the beginning of the piece, if there's no repeat sign, or you know, the repeat sign with the, uh, with the dots facing the other way, okay? And then, you're gonna repeat, you're gonna go through. When you, go, uh, when you come back to, uh, to uh, the first ending there, you're not gonna do the first ending anymore. You're gonna skip it, and you're gonna go to the second ending, okay? So, basically, from the beginning of the piece all the way to that uh, re repeat sign that's uh, after the first ending, you go back to either the beginning of the piece or to the repeat sign again, and this time, you're not gonna play anything that was under the first ending. You're gonna skip to the second ending, okay? So this is just a way to uh, write music that uh, doesn't change much, um, you know, the first time, but it does change a little bit uh, in there to warrant putting in a second ending. Uh, you guys will see how, how this goes. Another way is to use the uh, da capo. Okay, da capo means from the head, and it's abbreviated DS. And it could go uh, da capo, you know, al fine, or da capo al, uh, you know, uh, al coda. Uh, this example here, look at what it does. Is you're supposed to start playing from the beginning, all the way until you hear you hit the DS al coda. Okay, and then that means go back to the sign. So you have to be on the lookout for that little sign. And there's a nice picture on the screen right now uh, of the sign. So look for the sign, because this is where you go back to repeat from, okay? And then it says, from dal senyo al coda. And then you're gonna look for this other sign that signify going to coda. So you go from the first sign to the second sign, and then once you hit that second sign, you're gonna look for a section towards the end of the piece called a coda, okay? And uh, you're gonna have to jump all the way to the coda. Okay, so just another way of, of uh, you know, bringing you from this section to this section. Uh, a lot of composers uh, write codas very differently. Beethoven, for example, was known for writing these humongous codas that were just as, as long as the piece itself, okay? But 
you know, who says that you can't do that? You can, you know, other people can make small quotas with just the uh, material that's necessary for ending the piece, okay? And then you find things like da capo al fine, meaning from the beginning to the fine. So you were supposed to go back to the beginning of the piece and perform all the way in it until you get to the fine sign, and that's when you end the piece, okay? So uh, the different, different ways of... Uh, of um, repeating material that's already written down that composers don't want to write again. It saves ink, it saves effort, uh, it saves uh, the performer's uh, uh, page turns and so on. If you can keep everything uh, locally in one page, uh, it's a way of uh, lengthening the piece and restating the same material that to you might be really important for the listeners to identify the piece from and so on. Okay, motives and, and, and things like that that uh, need to be repeated and uh, left in the listener's ears and so on. It's nice to have a way to repeat things and not have to write things uh, over again. Okay, let's go now to the star book. And uh, you guys had to perform number um, seven, eight, and nine for me. Okay, and uh, these were all in meter five, four and you had to uh, conduct either uh, on, the, um, on the formula of three and two, one, two, three, one, two, or the formula of uh, two or three, one, two, one, two, three, okay? But number nine deals with switching back and forth between these, okay? I'd like to perform now the last three lines from number nine. I'm gonna set my metronome again at 90. I like that number 90. Don't know why, but I do like it. It's probably because it's not fast, but it's not too slow, okay? And um, I will perform, again, four clicks for nothing, and I'm going to uh, come in. Now, notice one thing, how I conduct this, okay? Uh, I'm taking uh, in consideration that uh, dotted bar line in there, okay? Uh, which is not a, a real bar line, but it shows me exactly how I should conduct either three and two or two and three, and go back between the two of them. Uh, but one thing that I'd like to do here, you know, which I haven't told you, is before each beat okay, of the, the first beat of the measure, I like to show with a bigger gesture that I'm coming down to a, uh, to a beat on the measure so that people listening to me or looking at me know exactly when the measure changed, okay? Uh, otherwise, they wouldn't know which measure I'm on and so on. So basically, uh, I'll show you how, how this is done. Okay, 90, four beats for nothing coming in. One, two, three, let's go. Ta, 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 Ta 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 ta. All right. If you guys came up to the same performers performance and uh, or close to it, you've done a great job. Okay. Remember, you're practicing these maybe two lines at a time. Um, and repeating them until you're really good and then moving on to the next two. And eventually I want you guys to be able to perform all of this from the beginning of the piece all the way to the end of the exercise actually uh, in one performance without stopping. Now, I know it's kind of challenging, especially with this number nine. It's long and you have to always be very concentrated and very focused on how you conduct. Okay, either one, two, three, one, two, or one, two, one, two, three, okay. For next time, I want you guys to look at number 10. Now, we talked um, two videos, again, I, I believe we talked about the uh, six, eight meter and how we divide uh, those six beats into groups of three, two groups of three, one, two, three, one, two, three. However, Mr. Starr in this one wants you to conduct in six. Okay, we haven't talked about conducting in six right now. But uh, he shows you up on top exactly how to conduct in six, meaning one, two, three, four, five, six, okay? So 
there's actually gestures for each of these beats. So you conduct on the formula of four, one, and then two to the left, one big one to the right, and then two more on the way up. Okay, so that's one way of conducting six. The other one, it's uh, dividing the, the, uh, the measure into groups of two. So three groups of two. So one, two, one, two, one, two. It's still on the formula of four, but then you have one on the way down, one on the left, two on the right, and two on the way up. Most likely you won't have to do this uh, when you conduct in a three, eight, or three, four. It's easier to go one, two, three, one, two, three on the formula of two, the simple meter two. But he wants you to be familiar with the way of conducting this. Just in case you have to conduct in six, four, for example, and the tempo is very slow, okay? If you go one, two, three, one, two, three, it might not make sense. So it might make sense to actually conduct every beat so that the, uh, your, your, your people understand exactly uh, where they are in the measure and they don't have to be putting down with a beat that's way too slow. So knowing how to conduct in six is really, really uh, you know, uh, handy. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six, okay? Or the one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, depending on, on the music. So stay with number 10 for next time. Great. Now let's move on to the um, um, solfege, the solfege number two that I assigned to you guys. Okay. And uh, I suggested like last time that you would uh, first uh, sound the pitches going to the piano or your keyboard at home and uh, going through the pitches, do, re, fa, mi, re, do, and singing them, okay? Do, re, fa, mi, re, do, mi, mi, sol, mi, re, fa, mi. Notice there's no rhythm right now. I'm not doing anything with the rhythm, just the pitches, okay? Once you've gone through all the pitches in here um, and you know the pitches, try to do it without the keyboard. See if you can remember those pitches, you know, without uh, sounding them on the keyboard and if you can stay in tune. That would be great. If you guys could do that, that means that you have a good ear and you've done your homework really, really well. That means that you have to sound these pitches in your head a lot of the times, okay? Again, put at least uh, 15, 20 minutes of, of practice like this every day and you'll be fine. Okay, then work on the rhythm, okay? Turn on the metronome, put the metronome at 90 or so, and just do it with ta, like I did before. Ta, 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 okay? And when you're done with that, and you, uh, you've uh, mastered the rhythm as well, time to put the two of them together, okay? And uh, again, you can do it slower than 90, but I'll do it at 90, and I will perform the entire uh, exercise right now. So, metronome goes. I'm gonna give you four for nothing. One, two, three, let's go. Do, re, fa, mi, re, do, mi, mi, sol, mi, re, fa, mi, sol, mi, do, fa, mi, re, sol, la, sol, do, mi, sol, re, sol, mi, do, la, sol, fa, mi, re. Fa, mi, do, re, mi, sol, sol, fa, mi, fa, sol, fa, sol, mi, do, mi, re, do. Remember, you had to have a very, very steady rhythm, okay? Uh, you held your long notes uh, long enough. Notice that their notes tied over the bar line. Um, on the last two lines of the exercise. Okay, you had a rest, a quarter rest in there, and you had to memorize uh, five pitches. Do, re, mi, fa, uh, sol, and la. 
uh, or six. That's six, actually. Do, re, mi, fa, sol, la. Six pitches, I'm sorry. These pitches, again, never change. The rhythm will change, okay? The um, sequence of pitches will change, but the pitches themselves never change. So if you sound all these pitches in your mind and you start to remember them, how they sound in comparison, for example, to the Do, you know, or the La, the four, uh, La A440, you know, this is what you uh, really need to, uh, need to do. Uh, excellent. I'm going to assign you two more for next time. So make sure that you ask for the homework in the... Um, in the, um, in the comments or, or send me an email at uh, the classical uh, music theory guy at gmail.com and I will send you the PDF, PDFs with the next two solfege exercises. Uh, they're going to be a little bit more difficult than this one, but uh, that's the way you're going to learn. Okay, in the next video, we're talking about um, everything that we have learned so far. It's going to be a review se uh, session. So everything about music notation that you know up to this point, we will review it. And the way we'll review it, it's through listening to music and listening and, and looking at the score to see how the composer has used all this notation and how the music sounds, okay, uh, that's using that notation. Uh, it's going to be a great way for you guys to put the, uh, the theory that you have right now with the practice and see how the actual composers have done all this, how the music sounds, and how it's interpreted, okay, with that particular notation. The only thing you're not going to know yet is about key signatures, okay? The flats and sharps that usually appear at the beginning of each line, you probably won't know about that, which is fine. We'll talk about uh, uh, key signatures uh, much later in, uh, in the course. Uh, but everything else you should be able to identify. Uh, we'll look at uh, music for piano because it's using the uh, grand staff, okay? And uh, maybe something for solo instrument, a solo instrument like the violin. And uh, there might be some um, elements in there that are specific to notating the music for the violin. And I'll talk about that. That's probably going to be something new. But everything else about measures, about meters, about ties, uh, notating pitches on the, uh, on the grand staff, you should be able to identify by now. Okay, so we'll use a specific music and now you can say, oh, now I can read the music. I understand everything that's in here. Okay, and uh, you'll be able to make sense of all this uh, music. Uh, some music is going to be more difficult and some music is going to be more basic. So I'll choose uh, both, you know, just for you guys to see how, you, uh, how you're doing uh, reading the music and identifying it and being able to follow, you know. Uh, each uh, each measure and so on and you know identify the elements that you see on the page okay so that's going to be all in uh, next week of course we continue with the uh, uh, star book that uh, is not going to stop you know, I'm going to assign you uh, uh, the exercises in seven four and so and uh, two more exercises um, in solfege again solfege is going to get more difficult and so on uh, so that's uh, going to be ongoing for, for a while. Okay. Until then, I want you to guys to stay healthy and safe, and I'll see you on my next video. Thank you so much.